Good evening. I'm Candice, and I'm an event manager. On behalf of Town Hall Seattle, it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's live stream presentation by Purachista Kapoor and Fatima Fakhare. As we get underway, I would like to acknowledge that our institution stands on the unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, particularly the Duwamish. We thank them for our continued use of the natural resources of their ancestral homeland. And thank you all for tuning in. We're thrilled to be able to, pre the, to present this event virtually in the midst of concerns surrounding public health. Town Hall is proud to be a community-focused organization and a place where we can share and sustain ideas and creativity, even if it means we can't gather in person. I'd like to thank Porchista and Fatima for appearing tonight to make that possible. For viewers who want to watch this pro uh, broadcast with closed captioning, we recommend viewing the stream on our YouTube page. The video will be available for re-watching immediately following tonight's broadcast. Town Hall and the nonprofit community at large have been put under a significant strain due to the recent wave of event cancellations uh, due to COVID. Um, if you have, uh, if you're able to make a donation, um, we would greatly appreciate that and welcome your support. You can do this at any time tonight during uh, the program by using the donate button at the bottom of your screen or by becoming a member on our website. Our partner booksellers have also been hit uh, by the negative effects of COVID um, and you could use your support as well. If you're interested in purchasing a copy of the book being presented tonight, please use the link on this live stream page uh, to purchase through Elliott Bay Book Company, our partner bookseller for tonight. Tonight's conversation will last about 40 minutes. Um, afterwards, Porchista and Fatima will take your questions. Please submit your questions in the Ask a Question button on Crowdcast. Uh, although we cannot guarantee that they'll be able to address every question, we'll try to get to as many as possible. Town Hall's work is made uh, possible through your support and the support of our sponsors. Our Arts and Culture series is supported by For Culture, Arts Fund, Seattle Office of Arts and Culture, and Winco Foundation Northwest. Finally, Town Hall is a member-supported organization, so I'd like to thank all of the members watching tonight as well. And now on to our speakers. Porachista Kapoor is an Iranian-American novelist and essayist who was born in Tehran in 1978 and raised in the greater Los Angeles area. She's the author of acclaimed books, Sons and Other Flammable Objects, and The Last Illusion. And her writing has been featured in Harper's, The New York Times, The Los Angeles Times, The Wall Street Journal, The Village Voice, and many others. Fatima Fakare um, is a digital marketing strategist who enjoys writing and speaking about issues related to social media, women and people of color in the workplace, and digital branding strategies. She's the founder of I'm Muslama Media Watch, um, a media dedicated to critically analyzing images of Muslim women in global media and pop culture. Purchase Kapoor's book, Brown Album, Essays on Exile and Identity, is the subject of tonight's talk. Please join me in welcoming Purchase Kapoor and Fatima Fakari. Yay! <laughs> so, I, should I read a little bit? That's the plan, right? Yeah. And then we'll turn it down for our conversation, and hopefully we'll have questions. So, yeah. anyways, hello. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Fatima, for doing this with me. I was so honored that you agreed to do this when I asked you. Oh, of course. And it's such a, I love it. I love you so much. And it's so great oh, to talk to you. I got you. I love that we're virtually sort of in Seattle, which I was saying earlier on, Seattle is a city I love very, very much. Mm -hmm. And I'd heard such good things about town hall. So I didn't, I can only just hope you'll invite me again so I can do it in person. But it is such an amazing lineup and what a great like all-star series you have here. So thank you so much for everyone um, who made this happen. And thank you, Candace. Thank you to the town hall crew. Um, so what, I'm just going to read a short essay. Um, this is Brown Album. And it is split into like two big parts. And, um, and they're mostly short essays. And there's the first section and then there's the second section. The first section, they're like earlier essays of mine. And then the second section, there's some later. And actually tonight I'm going to read an essay that's about um, 10 years old. So it is uh, one of my, for a while it was my most popular essay. It was an essay that appeared in the New York Times in 2010. And it was at that time my maybe 
third or fourth um, New York Times op-ed essay. The op-ed section at that time was using some new literary writers as voices in the section. It was pretty unusual. But David Shipley and Mark Lotto, my editors there, were really devoted to bringing in like literary writers who could bring in their own perspectives on different cultural issues. So I was kind of like the Iranian American writer at that era. And every once in a while, they would ask me to write something or I would pitch them something. And as long as it had some Iranian American spin, you know, it was like kind of a go. I mean, we'd go through editing and all that. But my pieces tended to do well. It was before we had the vocabulary of things going viral, but we would say like it was most emailed or most circulated. I forget what the term is. But, um, you know, my essays seemed to have an audience. At that point in the New York Times, you know, there wasn't like a lot of um, Iranian American essayists. So it was all just kind of a new, new thing. And so I was living in Santa Fe at that time. I was a professor at the old College of Santa Fe, which had just been bought by Santa Fe University of Art and Design. I was a new pre professor and I was in my early 30s and I was really missing New York, where I'd lived for most of my adult life. And we were getting close to the anniversary of 9-11, which was always for me very poignant because 9-11 was something I witnessed outside my uh, lower Manhattan apartment. And uh, so I was really, really plagued by, you know, those memories as usual. But then there was this another occasion for this essay, which was around 2000, uh, fall of 2010, there was a whole discussion about the Islamic Cultural Center that was being mm -hmm. built right near ground zero. They yeah. started calling it the Ground Zero Mosque. And that had also started a whole wave of hate crimes in New York City. There had been a mm -hmm. cab driver, um, some other hate crimes were popping up. And for me, that was just unimaginable because for me, New York City was one of the safest places I'd ever lived as a Middle Eastern American, as a Muslim American, as an Iranian American. Mm -hmm. And so that I had all these feelings of missing New York, wanting to be there, all these 9-11 memories, but also feeling so plagued that there was all these like Islamophobic hate crimes happening. So it prompted me to write an essay that was a reflection of, it, it ran in the New York Times for the title, My Nine Years as a Middle Eastern American, and we call it in this book, On Becoming a Middle Eastern American. And I only became a Middle Eastern American or I, I became an American technically um, in uh, November of 2001. And so this essay talks about that and talks about 9-11. And so for a while it was pretty much my most well-known essay and it, and it was like a kind of my big New York Times essay. So I, I'll just read this out loud. It's fairly short. On becoming a Middle Eastern American. In the late 90s and early aughts, I used to frequent a boutique in the East Village called Michael and Hushi. Hushi Mortazai, an impish club kid born in Iran and raised in the Bay Area, made outlandish, psychedelic, robot chic clothing and was getting the coolest of the East Village cool kids to wear his strategically slashed and torn Farsi graffitied shirts, though few of them had any idea that in some cases they were sporting post-Iranian revolution political slogans. I used to go to downtown parties in a skimpy halter top that featured newsprint emblazoned Mujahideen women brandishing machine guns, their bullets bedazzled in gold next to the words, long live Iran. I love the feeling of being able to be Iranian and a play on it at the same time. In one of the last days of August 2001, I remember visiting the boutique again. Hushi was giddily preparing for fashion week. His store windows were freshly adorned with his Persian collection, a new line of hijab and harem pant Iranophilia. Get ready, girl, he said. Iran is going to be the new black. Days later, there we were, two Middle Eastern 20-somethings who now had some explaining to do. Friends started speaking in roundabout inquiries. What exactly was the status of my green card? How were my father and brother fearing? Were they Muslim, by the way? Hushi's stylists, meanwhile, were calling him to ask how he was and when was he going to get rid of that window display. But somehow we were fine enough, even under the heavy air of everyone's condescending concern. Almost a full decade after 9-11, more anti-Muslim xenophobia emerged, fully formed and fever pitched, ostensibly over plans to build an interfaith cultural center near Ground Zero. Even in New York, stronghold of progressive ethics and cultural diversity, my longtime home. 
In addition to this issue surrounding the mosque, a Florida pastor wanted to burn Qurans on September 11, on the September 11 anniversary. And who has, yes, no, maybe so reconsidered after a hearty load of negative press and a dab of head shaking. Then a drunk white college student who had actually been to Afghanistan stabbed a Bangladeshi Muslim in a cab. For the record, back then I did not identify as Muslim. My immediate family raised my brother and me as agnostic as possible. My mother prayed to a guardian angel and my dad studied Zoroastrianism. But most of the extended hawk boards are Muslim and culturally it's always been a part of me. I'm also a New Yorker. When 9-11 happened, I had just moved into a studio 25 floors up with a nearly all glass wall that framed a perfect view of the World Trade Center. Now when I look back on ages 23 to 32, every aspect of my life is shadowed by what I saw through the glass that Tuesday morning. Two towers, each gashed and hazed in the glitter of exploding windows falling one after the other. But what was one simple apprehension and mortification and trepidation became increasingly entangled with feelings of exhaustion and marginalization and indignation. Just six days after 9-11 at the Islamic Center of Washington, President Bush said, those who feel like they can intimidate our fellow citizens to take out their anger don't represent the best of America. They represent the worst of humankind. He added, the face of terror is not the true faith of Islam. That's not what Islam is all about. Islam is peace. Did that assurance mean more to white Americans having come from someone who looked like them? Xenophobia and racism abounded. For conservatives, people of color, along with our white liberal, liberal friends, were lumped together in one misery loves company fringe. In the Obama years, conservatives positioned themselves as aggrieved victims. I recall the advice of an older female relative. Always let men you're in relationships with have all the power. It's when they lose power and get insecure that your problems start. Indeed, during Obama's administration, 9-11 payback resurfaced precisely because we elected an African-American president whose middle name, the name of cousins of mine, was turned into an H-word slur. A Fort Hood gunman, a would-be Times Square bomber, and the controversy over the Ground Zero Mosque made for a boiling hot summer of anti-Islamic assault. Anyone with skin as dark as President Obama's could be a secret Muslim, and any Muslim must surely be a not-so-secret terrorist. The world Hushi and I were in before 9-11 and just after was not a picnic for brown people. None of us breathed easy. It's just that we expected to breathe easier as time went on. My brother, who used to live in Brooklyn, discovered that many of his Muslim friends in New York felt that the construction of an Islamic cultural center by Ground Zero was a bad idea to begin with. For this sole reason, it was going to put them in danger. He and his friends were afraid. During our late night calls, my brother and I talked about nothing but what was on the news, and we laughed a lot, but we laughed nervously. My sense of humor honed in my immigrant childhood was my disarming mechanism, a handy way to infuse the blues with some off color. My humor curdled the moment I was feeling the most euphoric during Obama's bid for the presidency. I started murdering whole days in the dirty basement of the internet, the comment section of blogs. There an angry tribe of fake names spoke and misspelled obscenities and declaimed the true na evil nature of Middle Easterners and their intentions in this country. This is silly, I tell myself. These trolls aren't representative of my neighbors or of Americans. Then I'd go on Facebook and engage in more online warfare with friends of friends real flesh and blood people with real life names who a bit more politely and grammatically stated the same. And there was me, a non-Muslim, who was publicly, who'd publicly criticized certain Islamic practices, flaccidly battling for Muslims worldwide. It got to the point that I was telling people I didn't even know that their opinions were making my life downright unlivable. It reminded me of how I used to experience so many mixed emotions when I'd see a woman in full burqa in Brooklyn. Alarm, followed by a certain feminist irk, and finally discomfiture at our, at our cultural kinship. And then it would all turn into one strong emotion, protective rage, when I'd see a group of teenagers laughing and pointing at them. Every day, more and more, I lost America and America lost me. But I should have been in my honeymoon phase since I was actually a fairly new American. In the autumn of 2001, not long after the towers fell, as luck was have it, my citizenship papers finally went through. 
That November, I was in a Brooklyn federal courtroom singing along with a room full of immigrants, the national anthem that I hadn't sung since I was in school. I remember on that day, 9-11, leaving that foreground of my mind for the first time. I remember looking around the room and feeling, in spite of myself, some sense of optimism about the future. I remember feeling like I was part of something. I remember the feeling of my official introduction to the collection of words that would from now on gracefully declare and demarcate my two worlds, Middle Eastern American. The same hyphen has felt like a dagger that coarsely divides what had once been a symbol of a tragic and hollow bond. So that's that essay. <laughs> um, yeah. Oof. Thanks for starting us off on the heaviest possible shit. I know. <laughs> and not all the essays are that serious, but I don't know why. I'm trying no, to it's, a different essay for each reading. And I, that just it's perfect. It's perfect. A lot of your essays, I loved reading your book so much because so much of it resonated. Like, I saw myself and my own experiences in so much including the like you know seeing somebody wearing a burqa and being like it's my responsibility to yeah. make sure she is good even though i don't fucking yeah. know her you know yeah um so reading that you said that it was from about 10 ish years ago literally 10 years ago yeah uh, damn. this september will be 10 years that essay do you has anything changed for you now that you're reading that? Uh, one really big thing, and we had to change that a little bit in the edits for that essay, was that it's that issue of identifying as Muslim or not. When I had that essay come out, I was still a little bit like, well, in my 20s, I didn't really think about being Muslim much. I mean, not that I was ashamed. I just really felt like I, I didn't feel as Muslim as I do mm -hmm. now. And weirdly, as I get older and older, I become more a person who believes in God. I become more a person like my grandparents were. And mm -hmm. um, because my parents still are very like anti-religion in a way. But mm -hmm. I, I become more and more interested. And I've had grandmother who was like a Sufi mystic, you know. And so for me, like um, Islam is really special, actually. So uh, yeah. I, I, I think part of it does have to do with the xenophobia and Islamophobia, that it made me more and more back up into a corner and so the essays yeah. that come later in this collection, actually, I do very much identify as being Muslim. And so yeah. that, that is always an interesting that the part where I'm trying to identify whether I'm Muslim or not in that essay and I can feel myself struggling. I don't have that mm -hmm. struggle anymore. Yeah, I think it. I think there's been a lot of um, among the diaspora like us, either, you know, people who can pass as white or people who who didn't really like people whose parents didn't raise them particularly religiously or whatever. I think right. um, after 9-11, our, um, our communities kind of became more aware of um, the whole idea of Islamophobia and the basic, like the cultural possibilities around the identification Muslim. Like, you know, somebody can be Jewish and not be observant at all. And I think... Right many of us are starting to be like, yeah, I am Muslim. I don't, you know, pray however many times a day or cover my hair or like, I haven't finished the Quran, but I'm still, you know, that's still very much a part of how I see myself or, um, so I think that's a great point. Yeah. I also feel like that happened. <laughs> it's interesting, right? Well, and I'm, yeah. I, I'm lean now more into the Iranian part of my hyphen. When I wrote that essay, it was very important for me to say, look, I'm an American too. Mm -hmm. But these days, I almost prefer when people don't think of me as American. So in a way, the racists mm -hmm. who are like, you're still a foreigner. You don't really belong here. I'm like, you know what? Yeah, fine. You know, <laughs> like, I, I, don't, I, I am more yeah. and more uncomfortable with American identity yeah. than ever. So yeah, that's, that's really that. new for me. Too. That part where you're just like, these people aren't my neighbors and my friends. Yeah. And I'm just like, yeah, yeah we know. Yeah. Um, so I just love so much about your book. I don't even know where to start. I feel like um, when it comes to diaspora writing, I feel kind of like there are three different types of writers. And mm -hmm. 
let me preface this by saying this is not meant as a dig at all because I feel like <laughs> I have been all three of these archetypes during my career. But I feel like the, the first, like there's the like the native guide. No, oh, I don't want to say informant. The native guide who just wants to like explain. We just want to explain us to you, or um, or sometimes <laughs> to themselves. I mean, I, yeah, I fell on that a few times, yeah. um, for better or for worse, you know. Um, and then I think the second one would be like the Mariah Carey archetype, like Persian, Iranian. I don't know her. I write about <laughs> I write about insert topic here, and I don't want to be known as a you know blank writer, like an Iranian writer. You know, doesn't yeah. want to write anything about it. And then I think the third one is like the, the for us by us writer who's like, I'm writing for me, I'm writing for my family and people like me, I'm not gonna bother with translations. Um, and that's one of the reasons I loved your book so much is because I felt like all three of those write, those styles were like in there. And I was wondering if you could talk about your journey through those kind of like writerly archetypes. Yeah, I think that's a really astute observation. I like those categories. And I, and I think for me, that's definitely like they are definitely in this book, like all of them, because so much of this book, it, it like, you know, I was a trained journalist, like before I was like a fiction writer. And for me, like, I think of like my work as a journalist, like, all the things I ever do feel commissioned in a sense, because I think about the venue that it's for. So there's like essays in this collection. There's like several from the New York Times. There's essays in Salon. There's essays in Daily Beast. There's essays in Elle magazine. And there's essays in like Gornica or like literary journals or like just very obscure places. And every time I would have an assignment for a different menu, I would be like, okay, well, this is a different audience. And I'm one of those writers who really thinks of my audience. You know, like who am I talking to? Like, what is the crowd like? Like generally I wouldn't have even prepared what I was reading tonight. I would have scanned the crowd. And I would have just eyeballed it and been like, oh, are these older people? Are they younger people? What's what's the look of this crowd? And yeah. what could what what can I guess might might work best for this crowd? And that's just kind of like how I how I think as a writer. Like it's important for me to communicate with my audience. So I think just like the different places that the pieces were published really dictated that. And then like my collaboration with different editors. I this is something that readers will never think about, but like basically the only people I even name in my acknowledgements are the editors that I worked on here. And I, for me, it's always like, Oh, this was this collaboration with like, you know, like I mentioned David Shipley and Mark Lotto, the New York times op-ed desk. And they were really historic editors there mm -hmm. or like, Oh, this is when I worked with Maggie Bullock at Elle magazine. And it's just like, for me, I really cultivate like kind of like deep relationships with um, some of my editors, some of them who are great writers, like Sarah Heppola at, at Salon who be, you know, is a, is a great nonfiction writer herself. And um, so that's another thing that I think about quite a lot. Um, so I become kind of like a different type of translator, a cult different mm -hmm. types of type of cultural translator, depending on who I'm working with and, and what the audience is. And so that's just sort of like, like a weird craft thought. And then of course you have the issue, the fact that like these essays, like it's, it's about like, it's over a decade of my, my writing on Iranian American issues. So the first ones were like 2008 and they go all the way to like pretty much now. And I, those are pretty formative years in any writer's life, right? That's mm -hmm. like my early thirties to my early forties. So, yeah. you know, that's a lot of different versions of me. That's like when, when I first started writing them, I was like about to be like married, you know, and I was like engaged and I was a very different person than I am now. Mm -hmm. And I've lived in so many different cities. I've had all these health journeys. I've had, I've had so much happen. So in a way I felt like I was also sort of like publicly growing up with, cause my nonfiction was being so widely read. Whereas like my fiction, you know, was just there, <laughs> you know, but um, I was just constantly sharing stories about my life with a certain audience. And they weren't always an Iranian audience. I mean, they were often an immigrant audience or just an American audience. Cause I, I was in really mainstream publications that had um, big readerships. So yeah, so it's like those, both of those elements. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think <laughs> I agree with you that, um, the diaspora audience, uh, is a big one. And if you are any kind of Brown, I think there's something in here for you. So make sure you, you pick this copy up. Mine yeah. Is I've, I've been really right heartened now. to hear that from like different, like 
brown like people all over the place who are like whoa i really related to this and i'm like you know southeast asian or i related to this yeah. and I'm, you know like whatever like latinx and it's like really interesting to me all the overlaps we all have even though brownness is such a fragmented um identity it's so many yeah things. it's huge it's massive um it's it ironically is... most of the world but you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> we're all very different we're we're here we're just we're, we're all over the place you can't hide yeah. um i i also really enjoy reading your book because so much hit home like so much felt like i was reading about my own experience okay. um like and i mean like a like very specific stuff too like um i was trying to find it the, the one where you were reading you're at a you're at a reading or something, and uh, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad was at the <laughs> United Nations Assembly, and this lady's asking you about it, like he's your cousin, you know, because we all know each other. And I yeah. love that because you literally walked her through her own ignorance, and it just brought up every single time. I had I was giving a talk or something and somebody would ask me something so fucking dumb or I thought it was yeah. dumb. I mean, <laughs> maybe maybe it's not very like oh, generous of me. Um, but it just it felt because of 9/11 and because of all the conversations that were happening in this country over and over and over what is islam what is what are the tenets what makes you a muslim what do muslim people do and what do they eat and oh they're this weird species i know like, with all that stuff i was still having conversations with like basic i mean basic shit. i feel like um like well into the the teens uh and so that was partially why i, I like burnt out and i was like okay bye so yeah. thank God there's a younger generation to take this shit on. But I was <laughs> wondering, um, like, is that the stupidest shit anybody's ever asked you? Or do you have stupider shit? Um, I love, you know, I love thinking I about asked, this stuff. Well, it's funny because like there's two different crews. I, you know, like I won't say they're stupid. <laughs> I mean, maybe they are. But like, I, you I'll know, put it all out there. I'll just say there are questions that sometimes might irk me a little bit. And they're usually <laughs> yeah. asked by well-intentioned, by the way, I think generally, generally well-intentioned older white women, usually weirdly, mm. but also Iranian older people sometimes ask some fucked up stuff too. And you know what I'm talking about, right? They absolutely do it. So I can't oh say it's God. all a white problem and these white Americans oh, no. come at ignorant stuff because no. the Iranians do the opposite thing where they do the willfully ignorant thing where they just want to <laughs> kind of bait you to say something like oh and they're like oh, I, I kind of have this feeling ma'am that you might be you know and they're like hinting at something and you're like mm -hmm. what are you fucking saying just say just it you fucking know? say it you know yeah. and it's so embarrassing and you're like why are you gonna do this to me like why are you shaming me i'm one of your people <laughs> so they they do it too and i and i really do dread it so i see it's always like a, it's always like an old iranian man and then like an older mm -hmm. white woman weirdly yeah um but i gotta say like part of it is for the iranians it's like they don't feel like there's enough representation. So every time there is someone who's representing them, it's like, for them, it's stressful. Like, what is she gonna yeah. say? Is she gonna embarrass us? Is she gonna fuck this up? Like, you know, they're, totally. whatever. I, so I get it. And then the white people, like this is, I do think it's well-intentioned again, because I think there's not enough representation. They simply don't really know. And Americans, it's not their fault entirely that they're this ignorant. I mean, there's just not that sort of education here. When you go to like my neighbors in Harlem who are from Senegal, at a young age, they were taught all about the world. Like they knew everything. They spoke so uh -huh. many languages. Everyone I met from Senegal and Harlem was like unbelievably educated. I was probably the least educated person among that group who lived near me. Uh -huh. And but I don't find white Americans like that as much, like who learn 10 million languages, who know so much about the whole world. 
It's oh. a real problem. I think Americans end up being like, let's learn about, you know, weird American shit. And it's like, you only have like a 200, like, and change history. It's not that deep here. Well, we're not even learning so, about like a complete history either. It's really know, just it's like, like the. Well, they just teach the like victory. the Mayflower and. They don't even teach you Native American history. Probably. How great Thanksgiving was for the Native Americans. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's so oh. bad. So it's like, I mean, or like, why didn't I, at a young age, like I lived in an area in Southern California where Japanese internment camps were like very much in our area. Like the shopping mall that me and my best friends would yeah. go to was the site of a Japanese internment camp. The Santa, Santa Anita Fashion Park, which is on the Santa Anita racetrack was a pretty major Japanese internment camp. There was nothing in my school. There was not a mention of that when we were in high school or junior high. There was, we didn't, yeah. I didn't know what a Japanese internment camp was until I left the Pasadena area and I went to New York. And Same. then I had to go back home and I was like, this shopping mall, what the fuck, you know? Yeah. I grew, I was born and raised in Utah where there was uh, an internment camp. Had no idea, no idea until uh, probably after I was well living in Oregon. Well, anyway. And, and I really, well, and, and do you also find yourself, like I really identify as Asian American. I always say we're West Asian. And in New York, I've been part of like Asian American yeah. Writers Workshop and I'm really involved. And I, and I happen to grow up in a very East Asian community and I still live in a fairly East Asian community here in Queens. And so for me, like Asian identity is really important too. Did you find yeah. that? Yeah. Um, not really. Mostly because I mean, I was, I was basically like raised as like a little white girl. I, you know, it took me until like high school to put together, you know, this because I'm very white presenting. I'm, I'm pale as hell, right? Um, right? And the only real understanding I had that I was different was like my name was funny and. <laughs> Nobody else's dad really had an accent because I mostly knew white people. So, most of which, like, I'm very, like, they're still my friends today. Like, I, I keep in touch with them a lot. But um, I didn't understand why I was different until I started looking into it more in, in high school. And, like, because my parents, you know, my dad came in, like, the 70s and, like, the, the, the revolution and like the hostage crisis. I, I feel, I understand now why there wasn't this huge push to be like, here's your heritage, here's what it's all about, here's what you have to be proud of. Um, but at the same time, like I was just like a little irked because yeah. I remember in like sixth grade, they showed not without my daughter, Ugh. and. Um, we don't I remember a kid, yeah, it's the fucking worst. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I remember afterwards this kid who I will not share his name, but I still remember his full name, um, <laughs> came up and asked me if I was Iraqi or whatever. And I was just like, well, I'm not Iraqi. I know that, but you know, so it was just, yeah. In high school, I started, you know, taking an active role in my own education about my own ethnicity and religion and that continued into college and i was a freshman during 9 11 and so it was it was very weird it was all very weird and wow. i don't remember how we got started about this but i do want to say any questions you guys ask i won't shame you for them this is just me being judgy. <laughs> yeah. this is just me being judgy and i will hold i will turn it off well, I mean, you hear, you know, you hear all sorts of things, like, when you do these things, and it's like, you know, I don't mind if someone doesn't really know something, but there is occasionally the time where there's, like, a willful ignorance, or they're trying to, like, jab at you, uh -huh. and then you're just like... I had, a, I had a guy asked me, so I was doing a reading from a personal essay that was about my parents, and a guy asked me about Israel and Palestine. Of which I am neither. Yeah. Like, I was like, what are you getting at, bud? So, you know, it's, yeah. I'm less, I was less irked about the questions about, like, why don't I wear that thing on my head? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I was kind of irked about it. You can, there's Google, you know? Like, you can read a book. Yeah. 
yeah. I get that this is I get that that this is a very specific or those, but that's why visibility talks. is important. You know, we, yes. we have an education problem in this country, and that's why visibility of this sort of like, you know, yes. basic visibility is important because it's a form of like shorthand education for people too, and they can like catch yeah. up on the stuff they didn't learn in high school. So, and also just like normalizing. I yeah, think like, exactly. Oh, okay. So I live in Oregon. Hey, West Coast, Best Coast. And um, <laughs> it's very white in Oregon. I'm just like, that's, yeah. the, that's the reality. And I and other people of color have, sometimes you get a feeling of like um, people wanting to know about you because mm. you stick out. Yeah. And so then that, that makes, I guess people see that as an opportunity to be like, well, so why do you stick out? Um, yeah. Which can, I mean, it can sting a little bit. Because you're like, yeah. I, have, I live here. What? You know? Um, but It's funny. In that same essay I read, there was actually a scene I was, I just remember this. I haven't thought about this in like literally a decade. But I remembered in my original draft, there was actually a scene that I had written that took place in Portland. And it was the uh, first time I ever went to Portland when I worked for Spin Magazine. There was a festival called South uh, North by Northwest. It was like linked to South by Southwest. And I and I was like an events person. And I had never been to Portland before. But I was very much like an L.A. New York girl, right? And it was a really hot like fall day. And I remember I was like, you know, like, like you, fairly fair skin. But, you know, you can tell I'm brown. And I was wearing um, like hoop earrings and like a short, like tight mini dress, which I would have, you know, very normal yep. New York relic, whatever. And like, but like tight, you know? And I was walking through some area of Portland where it looked like, I was like in awe because it looked like it was like grunge era. Like everybody was like wearing like rock and roll shirts and like thick glasses and cardigans. Everyone looked like a Nirvana music video extra. And everyone was white, of course. And it looked very like heroin. And like, I was like, oh, wow, <laughs> this is like it. Like here, and I, and I feel like, but I kind of thought it was like interesting, but then I was noticing everyone was staring at me. And I realized I didn't even know what part of me stood out. Was it that I'm not white? Could they tell that? Or was it just like the cultural yeah. difference of me presenting like an LA New York girl in like a tight, like, kind of like sexy dress and like hoop uh -huh. earrings and like, you know, it was just, there's so many different cultural layers. And it's like, I yeah. just grew up just down that coast in LA. It's not that far, you know, yeah, really. But it was like such a culture shock. And I had never felt that dramatic a culture shock in America than I did when I was in Portland. That was just, I was going to put that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm actually not surprised. I had a pretty, when I, so when I moved here from Utah, I had a pretty big culture shock, but that's, half of that is yeah. Utah's fault. <laughs> let's yeah. Be, yeah. Let's be honest. Um, okay. I feel like everything we've talked about has been very heavy and I'm tired of heavy. Every, everything yeah. is fucking heavy right now. And so I want to shift gears. Great. And I want to... Like quarantine is a lot. We're all kind of doing it. I hope you're doing well. I hope our listeners and our viewers, I hope you're all doing yeah. okay. Um, but yeah. I want to know what is bringing you joy right now? Wow, I love that question. Um, my dog who's sleeping right here. He's oh, like, Cosmo. Like, Cosmo, the standard poodle sleeping behind me. He and I have definitely bonded. I mean, I tweeted the other day that I was like, wow, we're all married to our dogs now. Um, <laughs> like my husband. Like, he's the only thing I can touch and cuddle and, you know. Yeah. Um, so that's that. I Weirdly, like, I keep talking about this online, too. It's like I'm just baking nonstop. I, they said there's, like, two types of people in lockdown, the person that shaves their head and then the person that, like, bakes. And I would have thought I would have been the shaved head person. But apparently I'm the person that bakes. And I've always been like kind of like a nurturer, but I'm like, I don't even know who I'm nurturing. I guess myself, because I'm, I don't even like sweets, but I'm constantly baking every week. I bake like at least three or four different like things. So there's like that weird survival skill or whatever it is. And, um, and then I, you know, I just take my walks every day and I love flowers. New York is having an absolutely exquisite spring. So that's been really mm. nice. 
And then, you know, I'm, I'm so used to this pace as a chronically ill person. It really feels familiar to me. So it's not a huge shock for me. Mm -hmm. In a way, I'm a little bit more scared when we all come out of lockdown, what the world will look like then, because I, I kind of, I mean, I don't like the death and devastation, of course, but things slowing down a little bit, things being more indoorsy, like, I don't, that's kind of my life. I don't really mind that. I know. I, I love like, it. Yeah, I mean, there's that thing, right, where the introvert thing, and I'm and I'm kind of an extrovert. But <laughs> like, like, for me as a writer, I like the feeling of like being inside and just like cozying up with a book and you know that stuff. Um, but it is hard to be like in Queens. I mean, when I wrote that essay, it was like 9/11 was to me like the most heinous thing I could have ever imagined happen in America, mm -hmm. and then. To think that was 3,000 people who died and now in New York were like several times in you know, 20,000, whatever yeah. it is. It's like, it's an unfathomable amount of um, casualties. And so that's the really hard part. It's just to like, a part of me yeah. is like, wow, it's like being on summer break forever. But then it's like, <laughs> oh, there's the sirens going on all the time. Like, by the way, Elmhurst Hospital that people hear about is just a few blocks away from me. So yeah. it's just very real here. And I just feel like, you know, for me, like having gone through 9-11 when I was 23, that was so much. And I just didn't think I had it in me to go through another like New York tragedy. And it's just like, whoa, this one is in so many ways worse. And it's so much more drawn out. And um, yeah, but I'm also like the other thing that's giving me joy is like, I'm always like, a, I have to think ahead. And so I'm just trying to make plans for what my life will look like after this. And I just think that, um, I'm gonna leave America. <laughs> I'm gonna be a refugee. Yeah, yeah. 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 Th that's really occupying me, and I'm really excited about that. Let's talk about that. What's your short list for where you're going? Well, definitely East Asia. Again, because I've grown up in those communities, and I just know those communities well, you know. Mm -hmm. And so, and because I don't feel I can go to the Middle East and to Iran, I don't think that's gonna yeah. be a good option for me. Probably if I went to the Middle East, it would probably be like Israel, Palestine would be like the place I would probably end up working the best. But I don't, I don't really want to be in that region necessarily, but I want to be nearby. And so mm -hmm. East Asia for me is, and, and like ironically up to like this week, I was thinking Hong Kong was really high on my list because I have a lot of friends there, but it's that place is so devastated now. Um, but you know, yeah, like Seoul, um, Taipei, Tokyo, I'm thinking about all of them. I'm trying to figure out how I can like work there too and like teach English and things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, but I just really, there's so much that I love about so many East Asian cultures and, uh, I've always kind of wanted to move there, but I now think America is like crumbling in a really dramatic way. Like the American empire is on the out. I hate to mm -hmm. say it. it I, you're not the only one who's thinking it or feeling it. It's bad. And I You're think four years. And just for me personally, I'm sorry if this offends anyone. I just personally can't go through another four years of Donald Trump. I just can't do it. And it just oh, feels oh, really yeah. horrible in New York. And New York is the only city in America that I really feel like a part of. So yeah. I can't. I can't do this anymore. So I think I, I just yeah. don't want to live being miserable every day. And I feel like I wake up every day and I'm like, ah, oh, this country is fucking me up right now. Yeah. And I would rather like leave America for a while and then think, oh, America was great in these areas or I miss America, you know, because I'm always going to be American, of course. But like, yeah. you know, I got I got to like I don't have a family or kids, you know, so it's easy for me to just like pack up my mm -hmm. dog and just like still be. I mean, I'm I'm like in my 40s, but, you know, I, guess yeah. I still have a weird extended adolescence in a sense because I'm, I'm living like I did when I was really young. So I, I just am going to do that, I think, for a while a bit. I think it's really exciting. Yeah, I it is exciting. Of... I, you have to do things to make your life exciting. And for me, I, I need novelty. Yeah. And um, I just want to be part. I want to know that I'm contributing something to a society that's of use, you know? Mm -hmm. And I don't think I, I'm just getting too bitter here. And I don't like that feeling of bitter. I think a lot of progressives are feeling bitter and angry and hurt. Mm -hmm. And those are just, you know, that's just too much. Yeah. And it's also, it's really exhausting too. Mm -hmm. Just like the, uh, the yeah. constant fatigue. I think like if there's quarantine yeah. fatigue and there's outreach fatigue and there's just all these kind of fatigues. We're just so fucking fatigued. Yeah. It's bad. I don't yeah. blame you. Yeah. It was, this was a lot. So you got to yeah. just find ways to make life worth living. Yes.
one of the things that's made my quarantine worth living. Oh, I, I really love this book. I fucking love it. And you should all buy it. Thank Click you. Click that buy the book button. Uh, yeah, there's, there's, I didn't even notice that till now. How cute. Wow. <laughs> okay, so there's some good questions. I didn't I didn't scare everyone away. I'm sorry if I scared you away. Your question no, probably is dumb. We love it. And we love and a you know chaotic what? question. You know, Poro Chisto, if you want to follow her on Twitter, she'll take your dumb questions all day long. I Same. do. I I love chaos. I love she chaos. loves chaos. I love it. Um, Bring it on. <laughs> okay, I want to before I go to questions, I want to I want to insert my own chaos, and I want you to spill some tea on um, what's some like Iranian American drama that you just love. Like you get your popcorn, you saddle up, and you just watch it. Huh? Blogosphere, wow. Twitter, Shaws, yeah. whatever. Well, I really, there's some Iranian, like, minor public figures that I get obsessed with every once in a while. Like, of course, like, the Shahs of Sunset people, you know, there's an essay at the beginning of this collection I talk about. I've interviewed a lot of Shahs of Sunset people, and they're in that first essay. So I kind of, like, watch their social media, and, like, I look at all, like, the Farsi comments they get, and, like, the way they interact is kind of funny to me. There's one guy on every once in a while, there's an Iranian public figure I get obsessed with, and I think I should write about it. And then I'm like, this is too fucking embarrassing. I don't want to write about it. But there's a TikTok Iranian that I'm absolutely obsessed with right now. And I, I, it's almost horrible to talk about, but he is basically a porn star. He's a legit porn star who lives Literally, in LA. What's his name? I don't gonna... even know. Do we even say it? I feel, well, because yeah. I'm about to tell you something that he's doing this really bad. I'm not going to say it. Okay. Here's why. He is, he claims he's a Persian prince, which of course we're used to. Iranians do this shit all the time. That's not a big deal. Like, Adorable. Okay, yeah, you're a prince. We're all sure. royals. Right, dude. Okay. okay. That's not the problem, though. What, what is the problem for me and where I think he's really going to get in trouble is that he's pretending to be a doctor on TikTok and he's giving people COVID-19 advice and like, Maybe he's also pretends to be a dermatologist. Like it's hard to know what doctor he is because he talks about blood clots, but he also talks about skincare. He literally pretends he has patients in a medical practice. And so I've been like reporting him to TikTok yeah. because I'm like, this dude is gonna get someone killed. Yeah. Because all these Iranians especially think he's real. And wow. he's literally just a porn star. He has a whole like he's like a I think he's mentally ill I feel bad for him in a way and I don't want to get him in trouble but I also don't want to like kill anyone with bad medical advice so yeah. if you know who this guy is guys I'll tell <laughs> I mean, you so really we're, thank you please please DM me later because I'm very curious um but I feel like we're all already dealing with all of the misinformation from our like yeah. whatsapp aunties like we don't need anybody else we don't need it this guy oh, yeah, with false information yeah. yeah i mean shit i ugh. anyway okay well that's the best tea i got it was that's good. some good Porn tea star. girl that's some good tea Porn okay star. <laughs> so um y'all ask ask questions i'm gonna yeah. i'm gonna open it up now um somebody so leslie had a great comment she's wondering if the pandemic if you think that the pandemic will appear in your writing well, uh, Leslie, that's a good question because I would have said no just a few weeks ago. But, you know, even though I pretend that I'm not going to write essays anymore and this is the end of my like essay writing this book, I kept saying that actually. <laughs> I'm like on assignment for four essays right now, literally four. <laughs> and, and, and I'm probably going to take a fifth essay probably. Can't night. stop, um, won't stop. I mean, because essays actually pay my bills. It's hilarious, but uh, I can't escape them. But the but the it, the pandemic has worked its way in most of those essays. And in fact, mm -hmm. I have a, a book review that just came out today that I wrote mostly in March when I was actually in Paris, right before hours before Paris went to lockdown. I was in Paris, and uh, mm -hmm. it's in the book review. Weirdly, even the pandemic is in the book review. And the book review is about Frida Kahlo. It has nothing to do with this stuff. But like somehow it found its way there. So it's absolutely what I'm writing. It's even, I do like a newsletter, a sub stack that you can subscribe to for free and it's in all that stuff too. It's like I did not know that. Yeah. What? 
Bortista.substack.com, I think. Thank you. You know, just put that link out on Twitter, girl. Yeah. Um, which reminds me, I was going to ask you, pause in, uh, in audience yeah. questions for a second. You said you're working on your next book, and I want you to spill that. What's that about? Oh, yeah. So that book we sold as part of like the deal with this book. So it was actually, it's a rare situation where a work of fiction was sold on proposal, but they just, they just wanted it. And, and it was weird to me because a book, like I have to rewrite what I showed them, but basically it's, it's about the first Iranian reality TV family at a time of war with Iran, which almost happened this January, which is crazy. Ooh. And, um, and it's based on little women. So oh my like God. Female cast. And it's satiric, but, but it's like a very hard book to write. I'm kind of running away from it. Cause it like, there's a cat, a Persian cat and it has the Persian cat has its own language. Naturally. And it's like Valley girl stream of consciousness, like a Molly Bloom chapter, but in Valley girl. Oh. It's hard. It's a hard book to write. So okay, well, it's, it's fun, but crazy. But I'm I already can't it. wait. Thank you. It's Put called Tarantulas. Ah, Tarantulas. You know what? Um, I am unashamed in my absolute love with, speaking of Shaws, Shaws of Sunset, uh, Asa's uh, Tarantula song. Remember, she used to be on Shaws. I actually have never seen Shaws because I don't have Bravo. But of oh, course man. I knew who everyone is, of course. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah, she released an album and there was a song called Tarantulas on it. And it's like my favorite oh, yes, song ever. Yeah. I love that song. Yeah. It's good. Yeah, I think they're, you know, yeah, I mentioned it. I Ooh. like, I like the. Okay. I'm We've got some more great questions. So I gotta. <laughs> well. okay. okay, so Heather would like to know what Iranian or Iranian American authors do you read yourself for Ochista? Um, what Iranian or Iranian American do I read myself? Oh, yeah, tons. I mean, I like canonical Iranian writers, like Sadeh Hedayat is like my guy. I love, you mm -hmm. know, I read the intro to uh, The Blind Owl that was reissued years ago. That's, it's a 1937 um, Iranian, like, surrealist novel. It's yeah. really amazing. And I love, Sadeh Hedayat is my favorite. And then, of course, I love the poet Fulk Farouk Zad, who they often call, like, Iran Sylvia Plath, but she's much better than that, even. And, um, <laughs> yeah. And then, um, so the, I always like look back and read all, a lot of that stuff. But um, in terms of like contemporary Iranian writers, like I, I love Marjane Satrapi, like everyone. I mean, mm. she's to me like just the gold standard. And um, iconic. Yeah. And then we have so many good Iranian like uh, poets too, like Kaba Akbar, Solma Sharif. Um, mm -hmm. Tons, I feel like poets. I'm just not even remembering right now. Um, and then there's tons of Iranian journalists I love, like Human Mash, yeah. Adil Avani. And we have so, and they write really beautiful books that I think, in some ways, are very literary, actually. Yeah. So I, I think we have a ton of great talent. Um, so yeah, they're a big, okay. they're a big thing for me, um, for sure. I actually really loved all of Human Mash's books. Yeah, uh, he's wonderful. The, the Ayatollah begs to differ or the Ayatollah invites you to not stay. I love those. Yeah, they're, they're especially amazing. Especially as somebody who has never been to Iran, um, doesn't feel like they can really go yeah. right now. Um, yeah. Those books were such excellent windows into um, part of Iran's like psyche. Yeah, they're brilliant. He's so good. Yeah. He's like a good friend of mine too. I love him. He's just so good at what he does. Yeah. He's also like legit dapper. Like I just love. He's his... like he's like literally the best looking Iranian yeah. alive. Well, just like we always tell well that to him. We have dinners with him regularly, and we like just call. I mean, he does model hilariously. Yeah. He knows all these fashion people. He of course models. he does. And he's oh. like a man in his. I guess Human's like oh, probably early, like late fifties, maybe now. But he is mm -hmm. like the hottest Iranian of all time. He's gorgeous. Legit, legit zaddy vibes. Legit zaddy yeah, vibes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which I'm sure he'd appreciate saying. Yeah. Um, Are you here, Juan? Hey, Juan. We think you're cute. Anyway, so Candace 
has a great question that I, as an elder millennial, love. Uh, do you think that the millennial experience is as bad as we all say it is with like 9-11, the 2008 recession, COVID? Or do you think we're all just, or do you think we are really just whiners? Now, I'm going to go ahead and answer that one for you, Candace. <laughs> as an elder millennial, I'm going to tell you, no, we're not whiners. You're not whiners. I agree. Everything done fucked us. Okay. Yes. yes. I I really wonder if they're going to rename our generation eventually because we yes. had so many goddamn catastrophes. Like Jesus. I totally H. agree. Yeah, I mean, I'm just like a little bit older than you, but like when I graduated college, everybody was making like the idea was they would make six figures in New York City. Like I had an expense account the weekend after oh, I graduated. Literally yes. had an expense account. And then just my brother, who's a millennial, just five years younger than me, like the world was a nonstop recession his whole time. Yeah. Like he's never seen a time of prosperity. So I got a little bit of that at least. Yeah. Um, no, I don't think you guys are whiners. No way. It's Thank you got you. a horrible hand. Yeah. Thank you. I know we're not, but it still just really makes me feel good when other people acknowledge it. So thanks. <laughs> no, I, I really do. I think you guys have dealt with so much. And like, it's, I think this is uh, like, awful and the poor gen z kids even have it worse and they're like so we zoomers i know i love them i love young people i mean i think the boomers are the problem generation to be honest and we need to really have a frank discussion about the yeah. boomers and what's going on there not all boomers <laughs> but I'm not all boomers not i feel boomers. like i have already i've shat on enough and so I don't want to cool the discussion, but like I hundred percent agree with you about the. There, but also Gen X, my generation, like a lot of like the sexual assault stuff you see and all the Me Too problems come Ooh, from Gen child. X. Mm -hmm. The men, the Gen X men, the you know cis straight Gen X men have some answering to do too. Mm -hmm. I think. I mean, I don't think millennials are. We're not blameless here because I think our generation is. Um, I mean, obviously every generation is going to have rapists and shit. It's, it's not like uh, we have not gotten to a place where men um, police the behavior of each other. Right. And are honest with themselves about their behavior and about their male friends behavior. Because it's like if you, right. my generation, zoomers, your gener like everybody's, everyone's like, Oh, how do women know? How do women know so many women who've been raped, but no men seem to know rapists? Hmm. <laughs> Weird. Right. <sighs> anyway, I everything's terrible. Yeah. And yeah, I, I, I don't know. know. I, I feel actually um, in terms of millennials and even the Zoomers, like, I feel like there can be bright spots, but I'm also just like with climate change and it's it's very hard to be optimistic sometimes and i want to i love being optimistic i don't like being full of fucking existential anxiety all the time but yeah. you know um i feel like as as like a gainfully employed a very blessed privileged lucky like gainfully employed adult who has a 401k right now i'm just like yay i'm yeah. waiting for the other shoe to drop i know as i think many of us are yeah. So anyway, we're not whiners. We're the best ever. But no, we I don't think you're whiners. And we can't fix shit if nobody votes. Yes, so vote. you really should vote. Please vote. I know. I, it's really important. If you live Although in a this state election. that doesn't have mail-in voting, unlike wonderful Oregon and I think Washington too, yay us, oh, uh, re just request that shit right now. Request right. it. Yeah, for November. True. Um, okay, moving on. Well, that we have the president spreading misinformation on Twitter, and now they have to put a Twitter label <laughs> on his tweets. <laughs> I've oh, I've basically completely abandoned Facebook because yeah, I can't anymore. And I'm yeah. I'm starting to get to that point with Twitter, and Twitter's brought me so many wonderful things, including you. Yeah, and exactly. It's like I just love Twitter for the jokes and there's not enough of that right now. I mean, yes, I there's the, the millennial existential joking about how we're all dying all the time, but, um, 
you know, I just, I even try to keep news out of my feed and you just can't. Yeah. It's a lot. Hard. And Instagram, but honestly. It's also when we're isolated, you need to be so, connected through social media. What do you do? Exactly. It, it's yeah. such a major catch 22. I need, yeah. this is the only way I can be connected to many of the people I love because neither my husband nor I have like family here in Oregon. Um, I know. Ma not not a lot of ride or die friends either um and mm. so like the people i love 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 and want to keep in touch with social or you know i can text them and call them and i have been but yeah. also sometimes i'm like fucking quiet as an introvert yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully it's gonna end soon i mean some places are opening up in the country it's really we're, weird we're opening up and i hate it you know, actually, um, speaking of the Northwest, I remember one time on Twitter, you said that Paci the Pacific Northwest was only for extreme introverts. And yeah. for a second, I was like, <laughs> and then I was like, oh, yeah, that's it's true. I'm, a, I'm an extreme fucking introvert. <laughs> that's a vibe over there. It's, it's introvert vibes. It's 100 percent true. I, I think feel very loud when I'm there. More introverted. I feel like I'm shouting. Moving. Like I'm walking through the streets of Portland or Seattle, and I just feel like I'm screaming, and everybody's like, you know, <laughs> and and I just that's because I'm extremely extroverted. Oh, there's my dog. You can kind of see my dog. There. Hi, Cosmo. Um, <laughs> I love you. <laughs> um, but that's the thing. I have a, like a loud New York girl vibe, and so for me in those places, I'm like, holy shit, everyone's like kind of indoorsy. But I like that now. You know, that's a like, survival mm. skill in this. COVID time. It's Introverts true. are going to win this battle. That's the one nice thing about 2020 is it's the year of introverts. It is. It is for sure. And I'm just going to, just going to take that and mm, have it keep me company because nobody else. Is right now. Good. I think you guys are going to win this one. Well, I do. I do think that I've maybe become more introverted since moving here, but I don't know if that's just because I've gotten older or just leaned into it more. Who knows? Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, we got, some, we got some more questions. Um, I don't know what kind of timeline we're on. And so I don't yeah, know. It's 836. Is this only supposed to be an hour? I'm sorry. I haven't been keeping track. Um, what is it been an hour? Yes, it says it's been an hour and two minutes so far. Oh, okay. I don't know. Yeah. Are we supposed to? Whatever you think. I guess we'll just keep going. <laughs> um, <laughs> All night long. Someone who doesn't have a name, they have a, a handle, um, okay. but I'm afraid I will fuck up. Sorry in advance. D Denarian5906 has asked if anyone other than Jimmy Faulkner has ever called you Pia. I love that. So this is someone who's just read the book clearly, and yeah. um, good job. Because that essay is not available otherwise online. So that's cool. They're asking that. Um, no, Jimmy Faulkner is 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 the person that called me Pia, and that's an essay I have that's about me going to Mississippi and actually coming to know Faulkner's nephew and like it's called the Iranian in Mississippi. It's it's a pretty special essay for me that I'm gonna actually read at my Mississippi reading in a week or two. Um, but no, yeah, that was kind of Jimmy's, Jimmy didn't see me as Iranian. He could not like internalize that. So he just decided I was Italian. And, yeah. <laughs> so I just became Pia, the Italian in, in Mississippi. And I was just like fine with that. Cause I was, we were like hanging out with people that were like digging for Confederate gold and stuff like that. And the banks yes. of Tallahassee river. I, I didn't need to get into like being like, yeah. Iranian, you know, I fine. think that is so hilarious because how many like, Middle Eastern and Middle Eastern Americans have tried to pass themselves off as Italian, and you were just I, I have done it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, when you're around a racist and someone's like saying like "fuck Muslims," you're like, "Oh shit!" I'm, you know, I'm like, yeah. I'm like married to Super Mario Brothers. I'm like, <laughs> you know, Mario and Luigi. From, you know, like. <laughs> What, uh, what's an Italian thing? You know, I'm Francesca, I, you know, like I, I, I would do that. Yeah. Anti-Muslim hate is so scary. It is so fucking yeah. scary. Oh, it is like, we're going to like 
burn you people and like slaughter you. It is so angry and violent and horrifying that yeah. I will absolutely assume any other identity when faced with those people. I mean, self-preservation, that seems fair. I think there's also like, I feel very, like there's also the, the professional version of that. The, yeah. uh, the Schrodinger's racism when somebody's like, oh, so like, what are you or where are you from or where's your name from? And it's in like a professional context. And I'm just yeah. like, uh, I don't know how you're going to answer this or, you're, or how you're going to react to my answer. Yeah. And so like, I've, I've, I've done that, that too. Like if I don't think they're, if I think that they're probably not going to retaliate. Yeah. I, you I might never know. Like I'm a, I'm yeah. a Iranian American. Hmm. And right. if I if I do think that they'll retaliate or or just like be a gen, like a dick in general, um, I might go with the Persian. Right. I have never said something other than one of those two things. Yeah, yeah. That's well, in a professional context. It's, that's it's something hard. I struggle with straight up. Like randos coming up to you asking what are you like that's a perfectly unpolite question and they have a right to know uh yeah i'm 36 and i still struggle with that shit i don't know, I know. How to it's, it's a real issue i mean it's just like yeah i think Public it's, service it's announcement. don't yeah. ask people that shit unless you know yeah. them very well because it's yeah not yeah there, not your business. Got a very loaded history. If, it's, it's one thing, I think, if it's like a sharing is caring thing, and they're like, oh, that's cool. Well, this is my background and my grandmother. Like, that's fine. But yeah. I feel like that question is never really about that. It's just about satisfying no. your curiosity and then just making you be their weird cultural guide or whatever. Right, or right. board for them liking a cuisine that's not remotely like yours. Yeah. <laughs> All right, moving yeah. on. <laughs> um, I'm looking at these questions. I just saw this one question. I love this um, this heated question here about from uh, Bukta. Is that? Yeah. I'm so sorry if I'm fucking up anybody's name. Well, I mean, I love what she's asking if it is a she. So, so they're asking, vote for who? Biden? Is this not problematic? And Absolutely, it is problematic. Yeah, of course yeah, it is. I mean, look, I, I, I really feel that it's going to be very hard for me to vote. Oh, and yeah. in fact, I think I even said on Twitter a few weeks ago that if Biden's a candidate, I might not vote. And it, I, I really hate to say that because... I know, I know that's really problematic, but for me, there's just certain things that are really hard to get over. And I do yeah. believe Tara Reid. And I think there's enough evidence that he's definitely been someone who's been very inappropriate with women. I mean, there's, there's videos of him like sniffing women. It's like, so bizarre. Whole, he also doesn't episode, seem like he's, but... yeah, he's not in a good mental shape to be president either. I, I can see that. But I actually kind of think that it, look, Bernie was my guy. I love Bernie. But I feel like it's sort of decided that Trump is going to win again. I just feel that. I don't think there's anything anyone can do at this point. And, but having said that, when it comes down to it, what will happen in November? I mean, I might talk a big talk right now and say I can't even vote, but probably I will vote. But I don't know. I, I just, I really can't. Look, I'm still in that delusional phase where I'm believing that the Democrats still have time before the DNC in July that they can pull someone else and put them there. Because I don't think he's fit to lead Biden, and I certainly don't think Trump is. So yeah. I think that whoever is the vice president, like that candidate's going to really matter. So in a way, I'd be voting for them. But also, oh, yeah. look, they have a chance. They can. They can they can pull the plug on Biden. I don't think Biden's a good option at all. Same. Um, I, I think, well, I think two things. Bukta, uh, Kaisa. One, voting is not a national issue. You should vote in every local election that you can get your fucking hands on. Because local matters a lot. I mean, right. 
I after after this presidency, I'm never going to be like, ah, national politics doesn't matter because yeah, it fucking does. Yeah. But local politics matter very much. Who yeah, your state point. representative is, who your fucking mayor is. I know mayor is sometimes very figurehead position, but like that stuff matters too a lot, yeah. and yeah. can make a huge difference in whether your your state is taking COVID seriously or not, for right. example. Thank yeah, really. God my mayor, Kate Brown, put Oregon in a position where I feel like we're starting to open back up again. Don't love it, right. but they took it seriously really quickly. And so we're not, the West Coast isn't seeing the same kind of devastation as the East Coast has. Right, um, right, exactly. In terms of Biden, Ooh, babe, I'm with you. It fucking blows. I hate it. Um, I hate it so much. And I, oh, I don't feel like I can say I won't vote. I just, I don't. That's I the hard part. I, yeah. I mean, it's it's my job as an Amer. I feel very keenly that it is my job as an American. I don't care how fucking Leslie Nope that makes me sound. I need to do whatever I can to make sure that Trump is not the president because it is been very fucking hard for those of us who yeah it's been I, honestly it's been hard for everyone it's even been hard for people that voted for him <sighs> yeah <laughs> whatever because yeah of all of the shit that he's pulling and, and taking away and and just uh, i understand that the lesser of two evils ism is partially responsible for us being in this shit show at the fuck factory right now. Okay. <laughs> um, but I also know that whoever is in charge fills the Supreme court. They right. fill uh, judge appointments. Like they, they feel so it does matter to me. It does matter to me because abortion should be a right and um how's that for drama i want the right to have an abortion if i need one yeah right, right. i have i i don't want to be put in a fucking concentration camp right it's happened before y'all it was a supreme court yeah. decision so yeah. i i can't say that i won't vote i don't love yeah, and i can't either really say that i mean so, I, I feel like the minute I thought that that would even be a possibility was when I decided I had to leave the country. Because if, I, if I'm going to continue to live here, I can't like say I'm not going to vote. I feel like that's too crazy. <laughs> yeah, and I just yeah. have to be willing to like live somewhere else where maybe I will one day have the right to vote there, and then mm -hmm. I have to be involved in like civic duty in another country. But like, yeah, yeah I think it is it is tricky. Um, yeah, but you make a great point. I mean, voting is about many levels, and like. You know, there's a lot of big issues, and I don't know. There, a lot can happen till July too. Like, a lot's happened the last few months. Oh, Jesus, please, nothing the... else happened. Oh God. Well, they're yeah. also saying that it's like possible that he might delay the election. That would be crazy, oh, but it could happen. I, it's not without. It's not outside the realms of possibilities. FDR did that shit. Yeah. We know it's possible. Yeah, it's a mess right now. It's really hard to say right. what's gonna happen. <laughs> it is a mess. It is a huge fucking mess. And so, okay, yeah. I've been told that we can go as long as we want, but they cap it at one and a half hours, which would mean we have until nine. Yeah, yes. we have like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, how are you feeling? I want to check in with you. Are you good to wrap up, or I'm do you good. want? To I mean, I'm a night owl, so for me, it's like coming all on midnight, but it's okay. 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 I'll be up All right, for let's, four hours. Let's take one more question. Um, yeah. And I love this question. Also by uh, at Dinar. Din, so sorry. Why don't you just have a name? Uh, Dinarian5906 again. Asking the good questions. Uh, they're asking, is it fair to say that living in the U.S. or Iran or anywhere else for that matter? as an Iranian, at least in the last 40 years, is by itself a political act. And that, that's, a, that's a really interesting- um, That's heavy. Yeah, it is heavy. It's an interesting way to think of it. I mean, 
yeah, that's the thing about Iranian identity. In a way, just like American identity, it's so uh-huh. loaded. So like both cool. halves of that hyphen are so loaded. So cool. just a decision to like be someone that's left Iran, for instance, and has come to the US, there's so many political implications there. Like you can't pretend it's just like, you know, socioeconomic, like there's definitely yeah. a political tenor to that. And so absolutely, um, when you say though living in Iran as an Iranian, is that a political act? Well, in a way it is, but in a way it's not. Like some Iranians simply could not have afforded to leave Iran. That's the heartbreak of the revolution is that like, both the revolution and the Iran-Iraq war was that there were tons of Iranians that wanted to leave Iran, but they didn't have the means that some of our parents did have to leave, you know? my I parents very also, after they came to America stopped being privileged, but like they had the privilege at that point to leave Iran. Yeah. Um, so there are Iranians who have been stuck there now for decades and don't at all feel like they would support their own government, but they're just stuck, you know, not to mention like I had relatives that were in prison at that point and things like that. And so, so like the Iranian identity within Iran is sort of a different situation. It's hard to say. Like, I actually, when I interact with Iranians in Iran, I find that their politics are far more progressive than the Iranian diaspora mm-hmm. in the U.S. I, I find, feel that they are usually super progressive. I Unbelievable. Think that, I think it's it's kind of a mishmash. Like, like you said, there's a socioeconomic uh, angle. Yeah. But then there's also the foreign policy angle. Sanctions. Yeah. Ha- so like the revolution and then the Iran Iraq war and then sanctions has made Iran a difficult place to live for Iranians, even Iranians yeah. that don't want to leave and love their country very much. And of course they yeah. should. All their friends are there, their history is there, their family's there. I have not been, and so I can't speak to that experience, but I kind of feel like it is political to be an Iranian in Iran and um, to love your country, despite yeah. how difficult it is, despite what you may feel the um, those in charge are doing to it. It's the same thing here. I'm born and raised in the US. I'm so fucking American. And at the same time, I hate what is happening to this country. I hate who's in charge of this country and I hate what they're doing to it. But at the same time, I don't, God, I've traveled and I love traveling, but I have no idea how I would become, how I would start over somewhere else because I don't have that frame of reference. So for me, it's inertia to be an American right now in America, not political, it's inertia. But to be an Iran, to be an Iranian in Iran who does not want to leave or who does, honestly, I think it's either there's, there's politics behind them both. Um, but there's also just very real, um, needs like Maslow's hierarchy shit, like yeah. you know the the right to like have a, a good paying job and provide for your family and and get an education. Like not everyone can do that, or like maybe yeah. you got an education because you're fucking hella smart, but you can't get a job to save your life because sanctions have crippled the economy for fucking decades now. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think being yeah, in America, awesome. hella political. Even if, if, whether you downplay it or not, um, I also have a younger brother and love him very much. We joke that I'm the brown one and he's the white one because <laughs> he's, um, I'm the one who's really into like understanding my identity, and my Iranian identity and grappling with it and figuring it out and he's like, a white guy with a with a goofy name, and <laughs> that's I think he's uh, I've been working at him pretty hard, but he's he's also starting to understand and see more realities about. Is he in Utah? No, he lives in LA. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, I uh, I want to. Anyway, he he lives in LA. He he works in the entertainment industry. He has not changed his name, although he has thought about it so many times. But even even his like 
not changing your na your surname or your first name from these big weighty names that were given to us that are beautiful and I love them and I'm very proud of them and fuck anyone who has a problem with them. It's a very real yeah. issue to not get ahead because of your name sometimes or course, to yeah. have people, oh my God, I gotta tell you, the first time I saw your book, it was Suns and Other Flammable Objects and I did a double fucking take because I saw the name on the cover. And I was <laughs> like, oh. I mean, names like ours are all day, every day in like the political section or the Middle East history section. But yeah. um, they're not. But even my name is it. unusual among Iranians too. Like it's it's such a mouthful for Iranians. It was even. glorious. I was like, Hakbor, ooh, that's that's my people right there. Like, yeah, I picked that yeah. shit up, and I've been a fan ever since. And those that visibility, I think there's something political, even if you don't intend for yeah. it to be. Yeah. Because whether we want to or not, we are politicized. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense Ooh. to me. I got lots of opinions. Good ones. Yeah, oh, that's good. Her name is Dina. Thank you for your excellent questions, Dina. Dina. Thank you all for your excellent questions. I guess yeah, these are great go to questions. Gisa, go to bed or like live live mm -hmm. her nightlife. I like these night readings though. That's nice. This was so fun. Hi Candace. I, hi Candace. <laughs> hi, how's it going? <laughs> Candace has been our wonderful moderator for the evening. Yeah. Thank you so much, Candace. Well, thank you too so much for this conversation. It's kind of funny. I was thinking this has been so fun to listen to. Um, even though all, all almost every topic is like so heavy. Um, but yeah. it's been very yeah. entertaining. Um, we've been trying to keep it yeah. well. we're Iranian. We can't not be fucking heavy all day. Yeah. <laughs> heavy it is well um thank you both so much and thank you to everyone in the audience for listening and watching um please yes. buy the book through the buy the book button through elliot bay to support them um if you're interested in more town hall content you can follow us on this crowdcast channel by clicking the follow button at the top right corner um you can also donate on this page if you are so inclined donate um, they're so great donate thank you thank you so much um have a great night everybody stay safe thank you thanks bye